One of the things Jung pointed out, so I knew this guy once who had a mother who basically was trying that trick and she had lots of she was very smart and had lots of tricks up her sleeves and there's just no way he was going to go for it he rebelled at every possible moment and he basically became I would say somewhat hyper masculine in response which is, a, which is an interesting lesson with regards to the hyper masculinity that boys often develop if they're raised by single mothers because they tend to go one of two ways and he just fought her at every step of the way and it didn't happen but one of the things Jung said which I loved and you can really see this in the Crumb documentary is that the Oedipal mother basically entices the child, says, look, here's the deal, you don't have to do anything, but you don't get to leave. But if you don't leave and you don't do these difficult things, then I'll take care of you. And the child has a choice all the way along there. I mean, obviously, he's outclassed in some sense, but it's not as obvious as you'd think. Little kids are tough, and they make decisions all the time. And so Jung thought about it more as a conspiracy than as something imposed on the child by the mother, and I really like, it's actually a conspiracy between mother, father, and child, actually. And I think that's a good way of looking at it, even though it's really rough, because, well, should you hold the child responsible? Well, yes, but judiciously and not completely, because then if you deal with someone like that as an adult, and they're trying to escape from it, you have to go all the way back and figure out how the hell it happened, and then they have to adjust, they have to figure out where they opened the door like inviting a vampire in, because they can't come in unless you invite them in, you know. So, don't invite them in, because once they're in, they're really hard to get rid of, yeah, and they'll take all your blood. So, that's a cautionary tale. So anyways, Pinocchio doesn't know any better, and he's got the egotism of, you know, of youth, and he's offered the easy way to success, which is exactly what the fox tells him, and off they go to see Stromboli. So this is the song, I'm not going to read it all. Um, it's great to be a celebrity in actor's life for me. Um, you sleep till after two, you promenade a big cigar, you tour the world in a private car, you dine on chicken and caviar in actor's life for me. So, it's all this idea of, of wealth and public exposure and zero attention whatsoever to anything regarding responsibility or discipline or learning. And so it's a dual attraction, right? You get everything you want, and you don't have to do anything. Jeez, what a deal. And so that's what the actor represents. It's, it's a liar, fundamentally. It's someone who's acting out a, a deception. They're a persona in the Jungian sense. So the persona is the mask you wear in public. That you might even think you are, but you're not. It's this mask, and that's the actor. That's the persona. So the fox and the cat are inviting the, uh, the puppet to only become a persona. And, and that's, that's, see, for Jung, you start as a persona. And then, when you start to investigate the parts of you that don't really fit in that persona, that would be the shadow, then you start understanding who you really are. And that's shocking. Because the persona contains everything, roughly speaking, that you think is good, and maybe even that your immediate culture thinks is good. And then the shadow contains everything that's not part of that. And some of that's really bad. But some of it is good disguised as bad, and you can't break out of the persona and transcend it until you incorporate a lot of what's in the shadow and so for example, if you're an extraordinarily compassionate person, let's say 98th percentile will say you're going to be sacrificing yourself to other people all the time and there are people who will find that extraordinarily endearing and it will be under some circumstances, but the problem is, is that you will sacrifice yourself and that's a really bad attitude to have for example, towards adult males. It's a great thing for infants, but for adult males, it is the wrong approach. And so, uh, you will get taken advantage of continually by people who are looking for someone like you until you grow some teeth. And you'll think, no, no, that's the opposite of compassion. Being able to bite hard is the opposite of compassion, which it is. And so you'll have that pushed into the predator category. I'm not doing that, I'm not getting angry, I don't like conflict. It's like, until you bring that out of the depths, and put it on, so you can use it, you're going to be in trouble. And that's kind of Nietzsche's idea of the revaluation of good and evil. Right, you have a sense of what's good, and a sense of what isn't, with your conscience, but it's not very smart. It's got things in the wrong boxes. And a lot of the things that, even nature itself, a lot of the things that you accept as untrammeled goods, like compassion, let's say, have a very dark side, first of all. 
and second are not enough to get you through life. You need the opposite virtues too. And so you have to develop them. And so you get outside the persona to do that. But anyways, Pinocchio is invited to be a false persona to take the gains of celebrity without having to do anything to be educated. He's just going to go right to the top from right where he is. And you know, people are kind of fascinated by that idea. That's why you watch America's Got Talent or The X Factor, which are shows I actually love, by the way. Uh, you, you, you never see narcissism in its purer forms than you see it when you watch people who display an absolute lack of talent and become homicidal when someone dares point it out, right? Accusatory and homicidal instantly. It's, it's really something. And then now and then you do see one of these people who's so introverted and so out of society and have this unbelievable gift, which is also something really remarkable to see. And it's no wonder those things are so popular. They're psychologically extraordinarily interesting. So, okay, so that's the actor, first of Pinocchio's temptations. And of course it's the first one, because he's entering the social world. And the temptation in the social world is to be exactly what other people want you to be. And the thing that's cool about that is, that is what you should be doing. Right? When you go out in your peers, you should be not subjugating your individuality to your peers, because that's not exactly right. That's kind of based on an inhibition model. You know, you've got aggression, you've got bad habits, they have to be inhibited. You learn that by interacting with your peers. It's not the right model. Piaget, that's a Freudian model. Piaget was, was correct about that. He basically pointed out that what should happen is, let's say with your aggression, and hopefully you have some, is that it gets socialized. And so you, you learn how to play games, but you don't drop your drive to win. You integrate that in the games. And so you try to win, you try to play hard, but if you're defeated or you hit something negative, you don't respond negatively. And you can keep that all bounded within being a, fair, a, a good player, a fair, a fair player. And that means what's happened is you've learned how to play a game or a set of games that also includes the darker parts of you, and they actually become part of your force of character. It's way better if you can pull that off, it's, and, and that's what you definitely want to do as an adult. Like, all you people are going to have to learn to negotiate on your own behalf. And that, that's really hard. It means that you have to know what you want. You have to be able to communicate it. And you have to be able to say no. And to say no, you have to be built on a solid foundation. You have to have options. So you, you got to remember that as you go through your life. It's like, if you don't have options, you can't negotiate with someone. And if you're not willing to use them, they win, period. Because if you're asking your boss for more money, say, the answer is no. Because he doesn't have any spare money lying around that he can just give to you. And lots of other people are asking. So some of that zero-sum stuff, you know, not, not all of it, because often you cooperate with people and the whole pot can grow. But some of it's zero-sum. And so you better have a case made. It's like, here's why I should, here's how much money I should have, here's why. Here's the benefit to you that will accrue if you don't, if you do it. Here's the consequences that you don't. They're actually real. They will cost you, and I will do them. It's like, then you can negotiate. And you, you don't do that rudely. But those arguments, you better have them in order. Like, so for example, if you're going to negotiate for a raise or a, or a status shift, you better have your resume at hand, all polished up, and know where else you're going to look for a job, and you better be able to get one. Because otherwise you're just, you're weak, and you will not win the negotiation. And if you're too agreeable, so you're conflict avoidant, you will make less money across time. That's already been well established. And that's because you don't have teeth. Not enough. And so, in the little micro contests that you're going to have every day, you're going to incrementally lose to people who are more aggressive, who have bigger teeth, and that's what happens. So, so don't let that happen. You want to you place yourself so you can negotiate, because otherwise, you're just a facade. And in a real battle, a facade is just torn down right away. So, yes, well, say no more, right? Well, the cricket, he's supposed to be helping the puppet out, but he overslept. It's like, that's just another indication that he's not everything he could be yet. And that's really, ah, that took me a long time to puzzle out with regards to interpreting this movie. I could not figure out. All right, I told you this. If the bug 
is the person who opens the hero narrative and who can guide the transformations of time and who has the same initials as Jesus Christ. It's like, and is like knighted by nature herself. Why is he such an idiot? It's a very difficult thing to figure out. But, but the idea that the conscience isn't omniscient, even though it has that sort of, that voice of, of let's say, common sense. Uh, and that fits very nicely in with the Freudian idea of the superego, again, because the superego can be flawed. It can be too harsh, it cannot be, it can not be properly developed. You see that often with people who are orderly. So they're high in conscientiousness, conscientiousness fragments into industriousness and orderliness. Orderly people like willpower, they're very judgmental, and they like things to be exactly where they're supposed to be, but they're also very self-punitive. So, conservatives are much more likely to be orderly, by the way, it's, it's one of the best predictors of conservative. Low openness is the best predictor, but right after that is high, high orderliness. So, and it's associated with disgust sensitivity, which is really an amazing thing, we'll talk about that later. Anyways, the cricket, well, he falls down his first day on the job, he's not as conscientious a conscious, he's not as conscientious a conscience as he should be. So he's feeling pretty stupid, he's got his little millionaire clothes on there, but he's really not living up to them. So, he does catch up to uh, the fox and the puppet, however, and tries to dissuade Pinocchio from going down this road. And, of course, the cat, well, you can see what the cat's doing there, he's got a big hammer, big mallet, and he's gonna, he also shows you just exactly how much of a clue he has. He's going to wallop the bug who's sitting on the fox's hat, which I think he actually does. And, you know, then the fox can't get out of his hat and has to talk through his hat, which basically is what he's doing the whole time anyways. So, this I really like. So, you see on the left here, the cricket is, is speaking inside this flower, you know. And, like I said, there's nothing accidental in these, in these representations. So these are artists who are coming up with these compositions, and they, their fantasy has a structure. And so, the cricket is speaking out of this flower that has, well, you could think about it as, it has a sexualized element. So, you could think about that as a phallic part of it, and that part of the feminine part of it. Well, they are flowers, after all. They are the sex organs of plants. And so, and that's very much the same over here, as this is the yoni and lingam. This is from, from, uh, from Hindu cultures, and so, and you see there's a snake wrapped around that, and so that's f masculine and feminine with a snake wrapped around it, and that's, that's a holy representation, you know, a sacred representation, and it represents, it represents the deepest reality, that's one way of thinking about it, like chaos and order, surrounded by the snake, it's the same, exactly the same idea. And so the cricket speaks out of that. We already know that, because the cricket is the conscience, and he's been awakened in part by by Geppetto and, and the good father, and awakened in part by the good fairy and nature, and so he speaks with those voices, and, and he's also a manifestation of, of the underlying chaos itself, because nature and culture spring out of chaos, you know, I already showed you that schematic representation. Okay, so, I'll just end, I'll just end this scene, and then I'll, we'll have like a 15 minute break, okay? So, anyways, the cricket tries to make a case for why Pinocchio shouldn't go off to be a celebrity, but you know, it's a hard case to make, because the fox is very manipulative, and Pinocchio is naive, and it sounds like a good offer, and also the fox is actually quite forceful, you know, he basically takes him by the hand, so the temptation is, and this is something else I like about the movie, you can't just say, well, the puppet gets what he deserves, because he's little, naive, and what he's facing is really malevolent, truly malevolent, and physically overpowering. And so, the movie does a nice job of not minimizing the threat that's posed by this particular temptation. And that's part of what makes it art. Okay, good. So we'll stop there. We'll have a break for 15 minutes, and then we'll start with the stage. So, all right. So, here we are at the big event, and Pinocchio's off to be a celebrity. And, uh... The cricket is watching, and uh, Pinocchio basically, well, he's got some natural talent, because he's, he's a puppet, and he doesn't have strings, and he goes on stage and, with strings, and then he drops his strings, and the whole crowd is amazed. And the crowd should be amazed when that happens, right? You can imagine when a kid goes to school, um, 
and shows some independence, that that's actually going to... People are going to notice that. 